Father, we come humbly to the throne of grace. No pride, no merit, no boasting, no strutting, no swagger. We come as lowly beggars on our hands and knees. We come as little children with arms raised high. We come as loyal servants longing for entrance. God, we know who you are and we know who we are. You are the creator and we are the creation. You are holy and we are sinners. We were created for your pleasure. May you receive pleasure from what takes place this day. May you use our little gathering to encourage the discouraged, to save the lost, to build your church, and to further your gospel. You have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift that has not been rescinded. Knowing that the Holy Spirit works in tandem with your word, we pray there would be a divine fusion of truth and power, light and heat. We want to be affected by this word. Our goal is not simply to hear a tale told. We need to experience the storyteller. Our soul longs for more than a clever speaker. We need to experience more than a witty topic. Father, I stand before your people. Some are newly converted and need milk. Others are walking deeply with you and need meat. Would you feed the lambs and the sheep, the spiritual newborns and the spiritual giants? Help this to be another Sunday in which we leave convinced that our deepest need is met with the systematic verse-by-verse -verse preaching of your word. Make the gospel clear and our need of it clear. Help us, to give us such a, a deadness to this world to reject the constant wooing. Let us never slumber, never lose our assurance, and never fail to wear armor when passing through enemy land. After today, help us to have a greater understanding of the wiles of the world and the deception of the devil. May we leave with weapons to counter them and assurance that Jesus has conquered them. Father, help me to worship while I preach. Help our people to worship while they listen. I pray that our church burns with such a white hot passion for you that people will come just to watch us burn. It's through the beautiful work of Christ that we make this petition. Amen. Amen. A golden paradise. That's what Solomon built. Solomon completed this magnificent temple We've read the description of the inside and the outside. They've already had move-in day. They moved in the furniture along with the ark. They had the red ribbon cutting. Solomon dedicated the temple. He stood on a large platform surrounded by thousands of Israelites, raised his hands high, and gave a prayer of dedication. Today in our text is grand opening. This is the first day of operation. The temple is so clean and new. It's a gold building. Everything is gold plated, gilded and inlaid with gold. Gold used in copious quantities. Gold pillars, gold doors, gold fixtures, gold hinges. What vast expenditures of funds this must have required. This is a highly ornamental building. Gold everywhere. Walls, ceiling, floor, altar. Gold chains hung on gold rings. Gold statues of cherubim. The gold is glistening. It's so beautiful and so clean. I would just have, have it all roped off. <laughs> Tell people, 
You can look, but from a distance. Don't touch. I don't want your fingerprints all over the gold. You're just, gonna, you're just going to smudge it all up. Everyone kicking up dust and a, and a layer of dust all over the gold surfaces. Ma'am, just stay behind the stanchions, please. Yes, do not go past the roped off area, sir. That's how it would be if I ran it. This is a museum. Don't touch, just look. Security, tase anyone that puts fingerprints on the gold. Notice, Solomon is not so protective. This building is not a museum. It's a working factory. It's a slaughterhouse. There are not only fingerprints, but guts and blood. What happens on the first day of operations? What activity takes place? We find it in verse 62 of our text. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. Solomon offered as peace offerings to the Lord 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. The same day the king consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat pieces of the peace offerings. Because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat pieces of the peace offerings. So Solomon held the feast at that time and all Israel with him a great assembly from Leboth Hamath to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God seven days. Thousands gather for worship. This is a great attraction. People come from the north, Leboth Hamath, and the south, the brook of Egypt. From all over Israel, everyone from north to south was in attendance. They, they all gather in Jerusalem at the new temple. This is like saying everyone from Alaska to the Everglades went to Washington, D.C. This is a joyous and monumental occasion. This dedication lasted a week, and the feast another week. This was a 14-day total celebration. The grand opening lingered. Put yourself in the shoes of an ordinary Israelite who for all of your life has been bringing sacrifices to a tent. Now you bring it to a magnificent golden temple. The light beating off the gold makes it appear like you are walking toward the sun. This quiet, solemn air surrounding the temple is about to disappear. The people come bringing sacrifice. Our narrator gives us the numbers. There are 22,000 head of cattle mooing, 120,000 sheep buying. This isn't a quiet affair. This is very loud. To be heard, you must scream. This 142,000 animals seems like it was in addition to chapter 8, verse 5, where Solomon was sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. The sheer number is beyond comprehension. Staggering figures. Now, I'm not a cattle farmer. That's a shocker to you, I know. You walked in here and looked at me and thought, he's a cattleman. Uh, I'm not a cattle farmer, but those who have done the research value these oxen and sheep to be worth $50 million to $100 million. That's a lot of money to drop on the first day of operations. Here's a picture of the temple and what we think it might have looked like. Notice all the gold. To the right of the temple, you will see the altar. That's where the flames are shooting up. That's called the bronze altar. That's where the offerings were made. It's the largest piece of furniture for the temple. It was outside furniture. Essentially, this was a grill 
for roasting offerings. Poitras calls it God's stove. The people would bring a sheep or ox to the altar and tie it down to the four corners. They would symbolically lay their hands on its head to transfer sin. Then they would slit its throat, drain the blood, and then roast the meat. On opening day, they soon stumbled upon some logistical problems. How can we slaughter this many animals on one altar? It does not have sufficient capacity. It's not big enough for the number of animals present. 142,000. A way is found to make offerings in the court. They set apart the central area in the temple proper for additional simultaneous sacrifices. Within the sacrificial system, there were several kinds of sacrifices. Three mentioned in our text. The peace offering. That's where part of the animal, the breast and the right thigh, were taken by the priest. And then part was eaten by the worshiper in celebration. This sacrifice showed that God was at peace with his people. So much at peace, they could sit down and share a meal with him. What better way to dedicate the temple than have a sit-down meal with God? The peace offering, then the burnt offering. That was to be completely consumed by fire. The grain offering, that's an offering from the field. Leviticus 3 and 7 detail how these offerings are to be performed. Now, we have been transported to this opening day of operations. We are watching it. Solomon is not worried about keeping it clean. There is blood running through the streets. Blood splattered on everything. Gold splattered with blood. Imagine the sound of 142,000 animals crying as their throats are slit. All these Israelites are wading through blood. Their feet are blood soaked. Their ears are, fear, are, are filled with a death cry. This is incalculable gore. Imagine the stench that must, have, that must have created in Jerusalem. All this gold and all this blood in the same place. Why are they doing this? They perform the sacrifices so that forgiveness can flow. You, you can't just ask for forgiveness. You have to pay for it. God has to look through the lens of atoning blood. Hebrews 9.22 tells us, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. God has built this into us. You go into villages in the Amazon or Papua New Guinea where there has been no contact with the outside world, no Bible there. And what are they doing? They are making sacrifices. Why? To atone for their sin. It's built into us by God. Everyone is seeking to atone for their sins. In our text, God is saying, I will meet you at the temple. That is the meeting place. But I will only meet when the blood flows. The ground Solomon was standing on was literally soaked in blood. Which leads us to this truth. God's means of forgiving sin isn't clean and tidy. God's means of forgiving sin isn't clean and tidy. God says, I will meet you in the gold and the blood. I can see the purpose of this splendor and pageantry and gold. That seems like the proper setting for God to appear. But that's not enough. There must be blood. Consider the magnitude of their sacrifices. 22,000 head of cattle, 120,000 sheep. Still, it wasn't enough for your sin. You know what's crazier 
than God in gold and blood? God in flesh and blood. In the Old Testament, God came down in gold and blood. In the New Testament, God came down in flesh and blood. Why don't we sacrifice when we gather for worship? Because Jesus is the once for all sacrifice. His blood accomplished something that the blood of bulls and goats could never accomplish. Animals could never take away sin and cleanse the heart. Only Christ's blood could. Friends, you and I know today that the blood of Jesus renders these types of sacrifices obsolete. The ground we stand on for worship is soaked in the blood of Jesus Christ who was condemned for our sin. The temple was never intended to be the means of taking away sins. It was God's object lesson. All these sacrifices were the shadow. Jesus' death on the cross was the reality. They are road signs. He is the destination. These animals were not supposed to pay for it. They were supposed to point to it. The sacrificial system was designed and instituted by God himself. He brought it into fruition and he shut it down. He is the alpha and omega of the system. He brought it to life and he put it to death. There was another altar where a perfect lamb was laid. That sacrifice was final and complete. The impact of Christ's blood applied to your sin debt. The impact... Total and complete forgiveness. God the Father saw your sin and said, make the blood flow. And it flowed from his son. Jesus received an eternity's worth of wrath for the sinner. He paid for our sin. We have to preach that to ourselves over and over. When the accuser throws our sin in our face, we remind him the blood flowed. As the old hymn puts it, well may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. My God, he knoweth none. Praise God for the sufficient work of Christ on our behalf. At FFC, we attempt to be careful with the language we use. We do not call this area the altar. There are no altars in New Testament churches. If you have an altar, you are saying Jesus' sacrifice wasn't sufficient. Let's be particular with how we speak. Non-Christian, non-Christian, you can't sacrifice enough to be saved. You can't do enough good deeds, give enough money, love people enough, change the world for the better enough. Your, your sacrifices, the things you do to make God smile, your sacrifices are nothing more than washing and dressing a corpse. Jesus' sacrifice makes the dead come alive. Man can do the one, God alone can do the other. Non-Christian, salvation is not making the good works flow. Salvation comes by making the blood flow. Not your sinful blood, but Christ's sinless blood. And you say, Kyle, well, how do I know that is enough? Christ rose from the dead to show that the Father accepted the payment. Now you repent of your sin and come to the risen Christ as Lord. I would never name a church building the temple. Not Temple Baptist Church or the heretical Mormon temples. And here's why. There are no more temples. No more temples like this. 
The temple of God is no longer brick and mortar. And we need to be reminded of this. Do you, do you know what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6? That your body is now the temple of God. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is in the body. God is in the temple again. The bodies of Christians. So Paul concludes in 1 Corinthians 6, you are not your own, you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Paul's doctrine, your templeness. Paul's implication of the doctrine, God owns your body. Christian, you are the temple of God. And I ask, does your behavior line up with your templeness. You can't have ongoing sin coexist with your templeness. You know the children's song? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love, so be careful, little eyes, what you see. And there are a ton of other verses. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little tongue, what you say. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Sing it with me. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Nice thoughts. Sweet tune. Terrible, inadequate theology. <laughs> Paul would never sing that. And I can't believe you did. That's not how he would apply our templeness. God isn't looking down from above. He's in us. Keep the tune and change the content. I heard one speaker rewrite that song. Oh, be careful, beloved one, to keep your clothes on with any but the one who is your spouse. For you're the very temple of the living God. And how could you sexually sin with Christ living in your body? <laughs> Let your templeness lead you to holiness. By the way, priests performed all these sacrifices. They did the work on God's stove. All these priests were butchers. There were hundreds of them in the temple on opening day. They were blood-soaked. I've told you that the sacrifices have ended, the temple has changed, now the priests have gone away. The, the sacrifices have ended, the temple has changed, now the priests have gone away. You do not have priests. You have pastors. Pastors are not priests. Jesus is the only priest we need. Love your pastors, encourage your pastors, but don't worship them. Honor them, but don't think they have some special connection to God that you know nothing of. You don't go through me to get to God the Father. You go through Jesus. There is no room for a celebrity pastor mentality in a local church. God's means of forgiving sin isn't clean and tidy. Your battle to keep your heart isn't easy or guaranteed. God's means of forgiving sin isn't clean and tidy. Your battle to keep your heart isn't easy or guaranteed. Chapter 9, verse 1. As soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. God tells Solomon, your long prayer of dedication I've listened to it and received it. I will put my name in this temple. 
Not only are God's eyes going to be there, but his heart will be there too. His name is in it. His eyes are on it. His heart is with it. This is all anthropomorphic language describing God in human terms. Verse 4. And as for you, if, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then, then, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. God reiterates the responsibilities of the Davidic kings. David set the standard, a man after God's own heart. He, he repented quickly. He was a speedy repenter. God doesn't expect perfection from anyone but his son. But he does expect these kings to keep the statues, to keep the rules, and be quick to repent when they fall short. In other words, battle to keep your heart. If you do this, David's dynasty will last forever. There will always be a grandson of David on the throne. The book of Kings is called Kings for a reason. We are quickly about to run up on a boatload of kings in our study. The narrator will make a theological assessment of each king. How did he battle to keep his heart? Did he have a heart to obey God's commands? Notice the if-then construction of the text. This grammatical construction is conditional. If you disobey, certain things will happen. If you obey, certain things will happen. If then, each king has a choice to make. Are you going to walk with God or resist him? There are two paths. Each path leads to different destinations. This sober warning has a gracious purpose to keep them on the right path, to choose the narrow way, not the broad way. God gives Solomon the same guarantee he gave his father, David. We've seen the positive if-then now the negative, if, then. Verse 6. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statues that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them and the house that I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight. And Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. God lays out the high cost of apostasy. He spells it out for Solomon. God threatens to destroy the temple if any successor doesn't obey his law. If they continually ignore my word, if they persistently disregard the covenant, then God uses divorce language here. He will divorce Israel. God as the husband putting away unfaithful wife Israel. He said this in Jeremiah 3, I sent her, Israel, away with a decree of divorce. The future of Solomon's temple and David's dynasty depends upon obedience. If you ignore me and take up with alien gods, I will kick you to the curb. I will put you out of my sight. God will take away the land he gave them. He will withdraw the blessing. When you do not keep your heart, you forfeit the blessing. Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. In other words, Israel will become a joke among the nations. I will make you an object of scorn, says God. Church, this temple is dedicated and doomed on the same day. On opening day, God talks about closing day. No sooner than it is completed, a warning of its destruction comes. This joyous celebration will only be a distant memory if you don't keep the heart. I will wipe you off the map. And you say, but Kyle, 
God has spent so much time with Israel. Should he cut them off? That's a, that's a huge investment just to let go. Friend, God can reshape and halt anything at any time for any reason. He tells them, your destruction would all be so unnecessary. None of it is coming if you just remain faithful to me. Verse 8. And this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss. And they will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. The nations will look at the temple, now a heap of rubble, and mock and scorn and laugh and with vitriol say, wonder why Yahweh emptied his land and destroyed his house. This is prophecy. This text is prophesying the reaction of non-Jehovah followers watching the repercussion of Israel's long disobedience. Israel will only have themselves to blame for their bitter disaster. The nations like Mount Rushmore will stand peering over Israel. The whole world will know God's people were unfaithful to him. And they will ask, what's the story behind these ruins? It's a story of disobedience. The people who used to live here betrayed their God. Their hearts gradually grew cold. They died by a thousand slight decreases of temperature. Their infidelity will bring the loss of turf, temple, and throne. Turf, that's the land. Temple, that's the building. Throne, that's the dynasty. Their infidelity will bring the loss of turf, temple, and throne. Israel's fate depended on Israel's faithfulness. When God's people walk close to him, they experience his blessing. And when they stray from him, they experience his chastisement. God will allow his fame to fall when their heart begins to drift. That's how serious God is about hearts. Your battle with keeping your heart isn't easy or guaranteed. It's the outline, church, and the application all rolled into one. I've switched it up today. You're like, Kyle, I missed the 20 applications. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. This is the outline and the application all rolled into one. We are reading Proverbs right now in our family worship. Son, keep your heart seems to be the theme. This is a command all throughout the Bible. It's what Adam and Eve failed to do in the garden, failed to keep their heart. It's what we will not have to worry about doing in the final garden because we will all have hearts that will not need to be kept. They will be fully and totally devoted to their creator and redeemer. Until then, they have hearts like that and I have a heart like that. Now, when you turn away, that indicates something has captured your heart. You have a new love, so you turn away. You need to be on guard. Right in your seat, right now, thinking over your walk with God. Where are you seeing places of drift? Are you as broken over your sin as you once were? Are you as hungry for his word as you once were? Like these kings, we have a choice to make in life. We will walk the long, hard, narrow path, or we will opt for the broad way. 
We can keep the heart or we can drift. Are you pursuing God? How are you pursuing God? Tangible ways you are pursuing God. What are some tangible ways you are failing to pursue God? Your decisions have consequences. When you neglect corporate worship, there are consequences. When you neglect reading God's word, there are consequences. Solomon told his son over and over to keep your heart telling his son to do something he didn't even do. I've been praying lately. Make my children better than my parenting. The same drifting heart found in the Garden of Eden will be found in these kings and found in your chest. Beloved, like Israel, there are times when the world will know of our unfaithfulness to God. We are covenant breakers. We are sinners. We are unfaithful. To what will our God say to us? In Christ, he will say, Oh, come, all you unfaithful. Come, weak and unstable. Oh, come, guilty and hiding ones. There is no need to run. See what your God has done. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. He's the lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for those who believe. So come. Though you have nothing, come. He is the offering. Come. See what your God has done. Israel's fate depended on Israel's faithfulness. Thank God our fate depends on Christ's faithfulness. He was faithful in the place of the unfaithful. God's commitment to his people is unshakable. God's means of forgiving sin isn't clean and tidy. Your battle to keep your heart isn't easy or guaranteed. Our wait for a conquering king isn't silly or a pipe dream. Our wait for a conquering king isn't silly or a pipe dream. This section of verses, verses 10 through 28, will demonstrate how Solomon was a success at international trade. It walks out his ongoing ability to expand the kingdom, his trade partnerships, his national defense, his commerce. And in verse 10, he continues an old alliance. At the end of 20 years, in which Solomon had built the two houses, list the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Hiram, king of Tyre, had supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress, timber and gold, as much as he desired, King Solomon gave to Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. But when Hiram came from Tyre to see the cities that Solomon had given him, they did not please him. King Hiram gave King Solomon many building materials to complete the royal complex. So Solomon returns the favor and gives King Hiram 20 towns, 20 little villages or hamlets. We're coming up on Christmas time here. Have you ever received a gift you didn't want? This just makes me laugh. King Hiram is like, I do not want these backwoods hick towns. King Hiram is reading the list of towns he received as a gift. Buck Snort, Tennessee. <laughs> Monkey's Eyebrow, Kentucky. Possum Trot, Kentucky. Bug Tussle, Kentucky. These are actually real towns. <laughs> Hiram toured them and was unimpressed. He believes Solomon has ripped him off. I asked the question, is Solomon cheating the nations rather than evangelizing them? Verse 13. Then he, that's King Hiram, said, What kind of cities are these that you have given me, my brother? So they are called the land of Kabul to this day. The word brother 
is a diplomatic term to mean ally. This is not a term that indicates a fellow follower of Yahweh. King Hiram named the area with the 20 towns a word meaning defective, nothing, worthless, unproductive land, a marsh. It's an insulting regional nickname that still stood at the time of this writing. Not everyone comes up smiling during diplomatic affairs. Despite his apparent displeasure with the cities, King Hiram continues to trade with Solomon and gives him 120 talents of gold, according to the next verse. That's over four tons of gold. That's a lot of gold. And this gold was not used for the temple because the temple is finished. Solomon cornered the gold market. He's got gold running out of his ears. I, I, and I'm not sure if this gold was for the 20 towns. Some scholars believe so. But the amount of gold pouring into Solomon's coffers are stunning. Swelling the national treasury. Solomon excelling at international trade. That's verses 10 through 14. Solomon excelling at international trade. Solomon excelling at national defense. That's verses 15 through 24. Notice verse 15. And this is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon drafted to build the house of the Lord and his own house and the Milo and the wall of, of Jerusalem and Hazar and Megiddo and Gezer. Gezer is a um, retirement community. For <laughs> You're welcome for that. That was free. All right, Solomon used forced labor to construct these fortified walls. A massive, non-voluntary crew erected walls around Jerusalem to protect it from the outside onslaughts. Solomon built Fort Knox. In verse 16, we have a parenthesis. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and captured Gezer and burned it with fire and had killed the Canaanites who lived in the city and had given it as a dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. Now let's pause here. We are introduced to another king the king of Egypt, Solomon's father-in-law. Solomon married a pagan woman, probably to seal some trade agreement with this pagan Egyptian king. Solomon's marriage to Pharaoh's daughter was a marriage of expedience, not obedience to God's precepts. It was a marriage based on political diplomacy, not biblical guidelines. It was a serious breach of God's word. She brought different gods into the home. Let's talk about her father, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Well, daddy gives his little spoiled princess a gift. <laughs> Honey, I always, I always hear you talk about Waco, Texas. And you watch all those shows about it. Oh, how you love Waco, Texas. Well, guess what? I invaded it and killed all the men, women, and children. I mean, I torched them. Now Waco is yours. Thanks, dad. She accepts her wedding gift. And you know, he, he could have given her dishes. This gift ended up creating work for Solomon, as most gifts do. In verse 17, he, he must go rebuild the city for his wife. Verse 19. And all the store cities that Solomon had, and the cities for his chariots, and the cities for his horsemen, and whatever Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem and Lebanon and in all the land of his dominion. This describes the, the military garrisons, the facilities, defense networks, further infrastructure to strengthen the city. Verse 20. And all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who were not of the people of Israel, their descendants, who were left after them in the land, whom the people of Israel were unable to devote to destruction, these Solomon drafted to be slaves. And so they are to this day. But of the people of Israel, Solomon made no slaves. They were the soldiers, they were the, his, office, his officials, his commanders, his captains, his chariot commanders, and his horsemen. These were the chief officers who were over Solomon's work. 550 who had charge of the people who carried on the work. Now church, there's a, there's a significant number of non-Israelites in the land. And they're not Jehovah followers. They should have been exterminated from the land during past holy wars, but Israel disobeyed God. These are remnants of the original inhabitants, survivors of the holy wars. The Israelites become project managers, and these people, the other ites, become the slaves. Now, some Israelites were temporarily included in the forced labor to complete the temple and the other buildings in the subdivision, but here they are project managers. 
Solomon excelling at international trade, Solomon excelling at national defense, Solomon excelling at religious obligations. Verse 25. Three times a year, Solomon used to offer up burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar that he built to the Lord, making offerings with it before the Lord. So he finished the house. Solomon held the three annual festivals regularly celebrated in Israel. They were the three pilgrim rituals for the nation, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Weeks, Feast of Booths. Solomon is, is meeting the religious obligation set by the Mosaic law. He's maintaining orthodoxy in liturgical regularity. All the kings coming up in the book will be judged on if they allowed worship at other places, high places. Solomon is, isn't doing that at the moment. See Solomon's success at international trade, Solomon's success at national defense, Solomon's success at religious obligations, Solomon's success at sea commerce. Verse 26. King Solomon built a fleet of ships at Ezion Geber, which is near Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent with the fleet of his servants seamen who were familiar with the sea, together with the servants of Solomon. And they went to Ophir and brought from there gold, 120 talents, and they brought it to King Solomon. Solomon built a navy, a naval force. They have their little white sailor hats and all. King Hiram's people had sea legs. So they sent seaworthy sailors to help provide naval expertise. These ships are not for war, but for trade. Solomon chose a strategic site which controlled the caravan routes from Arabia. Solomon is taking over the seas. Really taking over the trade routes on the seas. You get a glimpse of shipping and commerce. Think long ocean liners with shipping containers. Israel, they were not a seafaring people, but their influence now enters the oceans. Solomon launches this breathtaking enterprise. Israel built the ships, Tyre sailed them, and both nations brought home the gold. Solomon is expecting, is, is expanding his kingdom with these entrepreneurial exploits. He found a, a lucrative endeavor and he explored it, conquered it, ransacked them. Israel waited for a king like this. This is their golden age. A king who went out and brought treasures back. A king who expanded his domain. A king who extended his reign over land and sea. God had fulfilled his word to Israel. He gave them a king. Their wait for a king wasn't silly or a pipe dream. They now have a king who outshines other kings. Our wait for a conquering king isn't silly or a pipe tree. It's the outline and the application all wrapped into one. We are the people of God and we await the return of our king. Our waiting isn't silly. It isn't a pipe dream. The king for which we long to return, will return. He's Israel's final king. He will reign over land and sea. And, and not a little piece of land in the Fertile Crescent, but all the land on the globe. He will not merely control one seaport, but rather he will control all the seas. Ultimately, Solomon wasn't the king the people needed. Another son of David will arise and take the reins of the world. Father, Solomon filling the streets of Jerusalem with blood isn't the only time the streets of Jerusalem were splattered with sacrificial blood. Your son Jesus walked that road to purchase our redemption. And Jesus walked that road again in his resurrected body. Thank you for showing us Solomon. But we long for another king. We long for your king. We long for the greater Solomon. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We possess an eager yearning for your speedy return. Amen.